ready to get started again. We're sort of hurting some people and cats and things around. So we wanted to take um, a minute before we get to our content creation panel to officially thank our sponsors and give them an opportunity to give you a, a little description of what their um, companies do. So our sponsors for this event are Juniper, Digital River, and Avnet. So if we can give them all a round of applause. And then I'm going to pass the mic to Kathy first and then to John and the other John. No, John's waving at me like he doesn't want to get up and over here and talk. But anyway, okay. So I'll give it to Kathy and then to John. I am Kathy Gadecki and I'm with Juniper Networks. I support uh, Juno's marketing and uh, we appreciate being able to sponsor this event for you. Juniper Networks is a networking company. We uh, provide routing, switching, and security solutions uh, across uh, service providers and enterprise. Um, last quarter, we reached nearly a billion in revenue for the quarter, so our strongest quarter ever, 24% year-over-year growth, 7,000 employees. So we appreciate your uh, letting us uh, sponsor this. And you're the next one. I am the next one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, my name is John Sekovich, and um, I run the consumer electronics business for Digital River. Uh, um, the, the consumer electronics business is the fastest growing portion of Digital River because people are buying consumer electronics online these days. And so um, um, it's, uh, it's an exciting area to be in, and uh, we like to, uh, to sponsor Thornton's events because he's always uh, got smart people you know, coming together to deal with uh, innovative topics and um, challenges that are going on and we learn a lot from it and we also appreciate having the opportunity to meet with you and uh, try to divulge, you know, our uh, solutions as well. So uh, so we're an e-commerce provider. Uh, the Probably the biggest thing that we do is provide the opportunity for companies who want to sell direct to their uh, end consumers on a worldwide basis so you can do it in Europe and Asia as easily as you can do it in the U.S., which is a challenge and we help companies do that. And uh, if there's anything that we can do to help, we run about $9 billion uh, through our uh, um, platform as it is today. And we've got a bunch of people that can help you sell it in uh, France and Germany, the UK, and things like that. So appreciate the opportunity and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Are you sure you don't want your chance? No, no. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for the round of applause for our sponsors. And just when you thought you were through with mobility, we've talked about mobility and security. We've talked about mobile app development. This afternoon, we're going to talk about um, the content creation panel. So you're going to hear a lot of interesting things. I heard some discussions at lunch today about electronic books and all kinds of other content. So this should follow right along that line of discussion. And then later in the afternoon, we're going to have our panel on virtualization um, and cloud computing. So I'm going to introduce Stephen Laster, who is going to be the moderator for the panel. So Stephen. So good afternoon, everybody. How was lunch? All right. So I'm Stephen Laster. I'm a CIO of the Harvard Business School. Um, been there for about four years. Prior to that, I was at Babson College in uh, blended learning. And prior to that, I was in industry at places like Sapient, Art Technology Group, and Bolt Brannick and Newman. Um, with me is Kristen Lofbled to my right. She's the manager of instructional technology at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where she leads a team of instructional designers and developers that support the faculty in effectively using technology in their teaching and research, uh, particularly online. Uh, before that, she was also at Babson College. And prior to that, uh, Kristen was a teacher both at the middle, middle school, high school, and college levels, has a master's in education and a master's in fine arts, and is a diehard Cambridge resident. I am. <laughs> and, to Kristen, and to Kristen's right is David Wiedemann, who's Director of Research and Instructional Services at Brandeis. His background is in supporting teaching and learning in higher education, and his recent interests in building communities, in building communities of learners. He sits on the boards of NERCOMP and EDUCAUSE Learning Initiative, and he tweets and blogs on library and technology issues. And David has a PhD in comparative literature and a master's in humanities. So we want to have a conversation with you all. If I were sitting in an HBS classroom, the next thing I would say is lids down. <laughs> but I'll leave that to your own judgment. And we say that to have an intimate time together. Uh, and earlier to, to an earlier comment, we don't believe in, in true multitasking at the business school. 
So, but we do want to have a conversation with you. You know, we've heard a lot this morning about issues of security. We've heard a lot about issues of platform, right? Thing, building software that does stuff. And I, we've heard a lot about entrepreneurship. From this panel's perspective, we want to build on all of that because we believe that without content, the rest of that stuff doesn't matter. So before we dive into this notion of content, I thought I would ask my fellow panelists to th reflect on the following idea. You know, we hear a lot of people today talking about sort of the new world order of content, the disaggregation of content, the book is dead, right? The newspaper's dead. You know, I can learn everything I need to know every morning from just Google search results and headlines. We hear about the rise of the prosumer, both the producer and the consumer of content. And some of this content that's being created actually might be factually correct. <laughs> so I would ask my panelists, from your vantage point, how do you conceptualize this idea of content? And what does that mean to you? So Kristen. I'm wishing that I had sat so there. So <laughs> I know. Um, Say that again, we'll get started. <laughs> what is content? What is, what content? is content? What is content? Well, I should preface this by saying I, it's been a long time for me in higher ed, so a lot of my remarks are going to be coming out of my experience working in higher education. So when I talk about content, I'm going to be talking about digital content and digital content for instruction um, in higher ed. I'll try and universalize it for the room, but keep me honest if I get too specific about higher ed. So. When I think about content, I think about um, learning objects, you know, material that you need to interact with to learn something. And so if I think about what's the most important aspect of that, it would be, and you know this from back in the day, I don't have too many ideas, you know, what do you want to learn and how do you want to learn it? So it really matters, uh, to me anyway, um, from the beginning, what is the person trying to understand or trying to learn through the content? What do they need from it? before you get to the content. The content could be anything. It could be a little video that you made on your iPhone, or it could be um, a highly produced piece of multimedia content that, um, you know, that you interact with, uh, with other people in a virtual environment or something. But at the, where it starts, and the most important thing from my perspective is, what do you want to learn? Or building it out to industry, what do you want the, cons the consumer to, what need does the consumer have that you want this content to fill. Uh, thank you. I, um, I, was, I knew this question was coming. <laughs> what is content? So I think uh, when you look at content in higher ed, it is it's two kind of things. There's the teaching content, what you need to help your classroom learn, and then there's scholarship or research content, what you look at or what you produce when you're trying to share knowledge with the rest of the world. Um, gain knowledge, share knowledge with the rest of the world. I think, in my, in my humble experience, that uh, higher ed content hasn't yet been transformed. Uh, it will be. I think it's transformed. Transformations are out in the world, but it's a little bit protected still, probably by political force, faculty tenure, need to publish in traditional uh, journals and things like that. Um, but I think that's going to be disrupted really soon. So, and I actually look forward to that. Having a PhD in comparative literature, I read a lot of that traditionally formatted content, um, and it's ripe for disruption. I mean, <clears throat> it's, it'll be good. Breath of fresh air will be a good thing. The thing that's interesting to me is not so much traditional content rethought in a digital world, but new ways of thinking or new ways of drawing connections uh, to help teaching and learning um, that the digital world allows. And I really don't have a lot of examples. I have a couple. Uh, Gregory Crane, who's a, a teacher at uh, Tufts, and he, he developed Percy, as a, which is like a classical digital, digital uh, library. Um, and he writes about libraries, uh, to the dismay of librarians. Um, he was imagining, he wrote this article a few years back called What Do You Do With a Million Books? And he was imagining the digital library. And he said, it's not just a bunch of books or articles scanned. Flat text, flat text files that you search, right? You search on metadata, you full text search. It's not that. What it really should be is, it's hard to describe this idea, but a, a collection of um, agents, content agents that they themselves are 
active, and they read each other. Um, at night, while you're at home sleeping, the books are reading each other, and they're writing new books made of themselves, right? The history book looks at the map book, and when you get back in the morning, there's a new book that maps this historical event on space in a way that nobody thought of before, right? And maybe the books have to invent their own new format to represent their own ideas. That's interesting. I sense that that's probably coming. Um, and then there's an equivalent for learning. So the learning equivalent is, you might call it com computer mitigated learning in the sense that it's easier to conceive. So like even in a traditional classroom, even a classroom like this where we face to face, stand in front of people, most of the work now is done in machine readable formats, right? A Word document. Um, a lot of people use course management systems, so online systems where you share materials, you, you write in forums. A lot of the all the communication in the class is basically electronic emails, right? All that stuff is all disaggregated, but if you could bring it all together and look at it and look for patterns in it and put a data visualization layer on top of that and do some linguistic analysis of the content there, you could open a window into learning processes that we've never been able to look at. You can see inside the heads of the students talking to each other, the group learning as a group. Um, and that's never been, as far as I know, that's never been really possible to do, except maybe in the intuition of the faculty member in the class, just kind of guessing how things are working. You can actually see that. So there's a couple people at Brandeis that are trying to do that a little bit, and they figured out this way to do a analysis of the linguistic complexity of blog posts in a class that was assigned to write blogs every week. And they can see, okay, this week they're more linguistically complex. Why? What was the subject? How did I teach it in the class? You know, um, who's talking to who? Who's st which students are influencing which students? Right, that kind of thing. That's where I think the interesting revolutionary content uh, comes in. How many of you would say that you work in a learning organization? About half of those of you who say that. What's your answer to content? Within your organization, what does content look like? Chaos. Meaning what? It's everything, all sorts of media, all sorts of types, created by all sorts of people, stored in all sorts of ways, retrieved by no one. So, chaos. <laughs> stored is probably over... It's the basic storage. Yeah. Yep. Basic storage. Elementary. Okay. Okay. It's stored at all, it's good. What else? What else? So humans being experts in areas, yes. bits being digitally stored, maybe not retrievable. We'll talk about that. And then physical, right? Physical old or established forms of content. Be reality, not just books on the shelf. Yep. Archi archival could stuff. Modeling clay. Could be modeling clay, could be other things. What else? Any other definitions of content? Sure. I think there's a recognition that these new social software kinds of content creation tools emerging, but there's this uh, huge cultural change because our content is email and spreadsheets and they're never going away. Yep. So then how do you take the, the status quo of the email and spreadsheets and fit them into this new, uh, uh, new methodology like, like blogging? And so how do you fit email and spreadsheets into new ways of connecting? Yeah, how many of you have email as your largest data store? Right? So about half? So given that content is many things, and I think what we've heard that content is physical, content is stuff created through established ways of doing work together like email and spreadsheets, that content has a major findability problem. Could we agree with that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That content can be acted upon from which to learn new things from, as David was saying. Right, so if we examine the nature of content, the derivative of that actually may be new content, which may create new insights. And what Kristen said is that the creation of content should be based in pursuit of something. Right, so content should be created based on some potential outcome. So that's one domain. The other domain is, you know, in the, in the popular press today, we hear people talking about this immediate, immediacy of access to content, yes? Mm -hmm. 
you can get it anywhere, and if we just write the, create the right mobile app, it'll show up before we know we need it, right? Now, if it's not secured, the world will see it before we need it, but that's a different issue. So we have this immediacy of access to content, and arguably that, you know, it's revolutionized the world. Uh, in terms of business education, it's a blessing and a curse. So how, how many of you went through a business program or an MBA program in your careers and remember the case study, right? And you could get to this crescendo moment in the classroom when you were about, heard the faculty member talk about the viewpoint of the protagonist and what they might have done well. Think about that classroom with some 20-something on his mobile device in the background looking it up saying, no, that's not really how it worked out. <laughs> and they're bankrupt now, did you know that? And so-and-so got fired two years later. And why are we teaching this case? But that's good. That's real learning, right? So, so my question to you, David, is that is real learning. But what opportunities and concerns do you see associated with this ability to have immediate access? Opportunities well, and concerns. Opportunities and concerns. I don't really have concerns. I, uh, of course, I like a little bit of chaos. I think that we'll rise to the level of dealing with uh, millions of different things in different packages in different places. I'm not really worried about it. Um, what I'm more worried about, I guess, is when there wasn't the immediacy, how uh, the loss of a spontaneity or an energy or a life kind of excitement sort of ruined the learning experience for a lot of people and they were just kind of turned off. Whereas really humans are meant to learn and it's incredibly enriching and incredibly powerful. So the immediacy of content is kind of, I think, bringing that feeling back into teaching and learning, which risks losing it. And just a couple of examples, right? So immediacy of finding search results on Google is the single most destabilizing thing that any library will ever experience, ever. I mean, we used, you used to have to come to us, get an appointment, or find us at the re reference desk or whatever, sit down with us, and we would, at our pace, talk you through what you needed to know. Right? Um, we didn't ask you if you enjoyed that process. Because right? <laughs> we were the ones who had the information. Um, you can now find what you need, or what you think you need, which I think equals what you need. Uh, we may give you different things than you might get from Google, but you're getting stuff that's moving you on, and you're doing it, and you're moving forward, and you're writing your paper, and you're getting your feedback. You're productive, right? Um, and we're still designed around the old model, where we think you need to come see us. So we're still, unfortunately, a little bit gatekeeper mentality in a place where there's really no fences left uh, even. Um, and the classroom, so that's kind of the research angle. The classroom content, I think, actually has fueled a revitalization of learning. Um, what is real learning? And it's worked kind of like this. If you're a professor 50 years ago, you teach the way you, you, you learned, right? You lecture in front of the classroom, case studies in the business school, what have you. Uh, you don't really need to reflect upon it because it's a static environment and you're just gonna do what's been successful. And that makes sense. But now you find, say you're a professor today, you find yourself confronted with different kinds of content, different ways to deliver it, like blended learning, right? Blended learning's half in the classroom, half online. And you've gotta figure out, well, what do I do in the classroom that honors the classroom space, and what do I do online that works there? And which students are going to do well in which environments? And how do I make sure that they're mushed together well? It's a holistic thing. Um, to do that, you said to yourself, well, you know, I, how do I teach? How do people learn? How do I do this? You know, you, you find your way back to these core questions about teaching, pedagogy, communication, that you probably should have always been thinking about, but you didn't have to. And because of that, I think content is forcing people to actually be reflective about things that never work. And so we're seeing a kind of a revolution, I think, on the ground uh, in learning, K-12 and higher ed, that I think will make it more immediate as well and more compelling to the people involved in it. Now I'm like, which is worse, to go first or to go second? Because I just get caught up listening to uh, you. And um, I just want to step back for one second about the first question, what is content? Because it might contextualize my response to the second question. So when I think about content, especially around, um, I mentioned that I think about it in terms of digital content, but just to uh, go into a little bit more detail, I think about it in different ways. I think about it in terms of pre-existing content, digital content, stuff that's already out there, uh, content that's digitized. So it used to be 
a physical artifact and now it's a 3D visualization of that piece of clay or something like that. Then there's co-created content, which at its best is a meaningful classroom activity or a, a course activity. At its worst is just like a, a Flickr group of photos or something like that that has no meaning. And then there's content that's created for a specific purpose, like creating an online tutorial to help um, somebody learn something so you can take that learning out of the classroom and have them interact with the content at their own pace online to keep the classroom conversation as rich as possible. So in my mind, just so you know, I'm thinking of those, I think that was four mm -hmm. types of content. So then to your question, tell me if this is the question, it's been a while, is, um, the immediacy of content, the triumphs and tragedies, the pros and cons. I think that um, uh, the positive about having immediate content is um, that the world is moving very fast now, that um, information changes really rapidly. So if you, if you have to wait for a book to be published, by the time it's in the hands of the consumer, it's been a couple years since it, the material was created. So um, immediacy is good. Also, I think of um, in my own career, back when we were at Babson Interactive, I don't even want to think about how much it cost for us to make that first digital learning experience that we made, um, but it was, it was a lot of money, more money than I have made total since that time, I think. <laughs> and I could have cranked that out today with my team of three people using really simple applications now, but back 10 years ago, it was really expensive. So I think that the technology to facilitate content creation has gotten so much more user friendly that you can crank things out more quickly. So it costs less from a business standpoint in terms of uh, the design and development process. So that's good. I should mention too, I'm kind of an organized, methodical person. So I'm like the buzzkill at an innovation conference, but just a, a refreshing voice. The, no, you're the, the foundation on which innovation happens. Maybe. I'm ops. Um, but, but the drawback of the immediacy of content is back to what I was saying is so important to me is it has to have meaning. Um, just creating for creating's sake has a lot of uh, danger. Sometimes it's, it's exciting, but it's, if nothing goes wrong, that's probably by accident. You know, um, before I got into um, the field of education, I worked in book publishing. And there was value to, first the author wrote the book, and then an editor helped him with it. Then uh, it got, went through the copy editing process. Then it went into production. There was, that was pretty. I know you started out as a developer a, a long time ago. And I think uh, application development follows sort of the same cycle. And it's really important to write the book before it goes into production. And with the immediacy of content, too often people are putting things into production before the ideas are complete. And um, that can be exciting. It can be exciting. We're at di we're, this is great. This is yeah. <laughs> so to me that <laughs> to me that that um, that's not a place of comfort for me and the way that I work professionally or personally. I think that you create might, that. You enjoy that. Yeah. yeah. But that will make for an interesting conversation. So. Other thoughts. Immediacy: the ability to immediately create and distribute content. Good, powerful, evil, awful. You know, potentially one thing that's missing is the opportunity to reflect. Um, it, it just it doesn't. The immediacy does not mean time to reflect. Or you're catching up to the next piece of information coming at you. Uh, that's a good point. Time to reflect. Yeah. And so let me ask you a question. Another question. How many people use Outlook as their mail client? Raise your hands. How many of it have set, sent to a one-minute delay sent? Oh, I wish. You can oh, you can set. Outlook to do a one minute delayed send. Three minute delay. There's a three minute delay over here. Why would you do that? What did you just say? How many of you have ever sent? Oh, 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 like the, the thing, so don't email angry, yes? <laughs> right, how many of you have sent the, sent the email you wish you had never sent in your whole careers? <laughs> right? So in that case, you actually have the power to build in time to reflect. But how many people knew about that feature before this conversation? About 15%. People with anger management issues. <laughs> <laughs> now we're sharing personal information here. <laughs> so time to reflect. Other concerns, other things that really make you excited? Yeah? The, 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 uh, in addition to immediacy, I guess you could say the legitimacy. Um, when things were done the old-fashioned way, as, as it were, um, there was there was vetting, there was peer review, 
um, often uh, the content passed through several uh, reviews, drying stages, drying stages uh, or, or development stages uh, bef before it was made available. Now, uh, a blogger in a, in a moment of inspiration, the words out of their mouth have just as much uh, potential uh, uh, perceived legitimacy as 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 that w w w which came out of somebody who, who went through a very deliberate, thoughtful process, and 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 most people, I think, are not yet in a in a mode where they can discern between the two. That's a good point. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. Dennis, that's a great point. So the shift to in a in the world where everybody can write stuff, the onus goes to the consumer to make the evaluation right. between what's good and what isn't good. But then the disadvantage is what we used to think was good gets drowned out by stuff we don't yet know is good. But the advantage is we get the opportunity to find these things that would have never made it through the whole infrastructure of the drying and uh, de-energizing um, process known as publication. <laughs> How many people, uh, well, how many of you know that Al Gore really didn't say he created the internet? Because <laughs> he didn't. Right? If you actually read what he said, that's not what he said at all. Right? So, from your perspectives, fellow panelists, mm -hmm. So we do have this issue of there's no more drying time. And you are in your own ways responsible for training the workforce of the future. So what does this mean for today's student? How do we help them in this world of unvetted, fast-changing content such that they can be productive as they enter the workforce? Oh, I might take that to start because I'm also thinking of your question about um, no time for reflection and stuff. And I'm thinking about this. Um, this forum, how we're doing this. Um, so there's probably some uh, reflective people here who might have wanted to say something from something we talked about a while ago, but life is live, and this is going to go too fast for somebody who needs a few minutes to um, gather your thoughts before you respond. I might be one of those people. I might be one of those people that would be a better candidate if this took place online in an asynchronous situation, so I could have time to gather my thoughts, and so I could um, carefully, in writing, uh, prepare my response. But life is live. You can't always choose how you want to deliver information. Same goes with the classroom. I mean, um, speaking back to the case method and uh, in business uh, school preparation for business, the whole cold calling approach, you know. So that was at the time that I was at Babson, for example, there was like, it's very important that um, you're going to be able to think on your feet and life is live and all this sort of stuff. So we're going to cold call you. But um, that's only for one kind. That's only successful for one kind of learner, and that only works in certain kinds of businesses. Um, so it gets back to the thing I mentioned at the beginning: is about think about what you want the person to learn, and then how you want them to learn it. So in a school setting, I might say, "Well, what is the um, what's the learning challenge? What do you want the students to learn?" And then let's look at multiple learning styles and learning preferences, and let's mix it up over the course of a semester or of the course of um, an assignment so that there are different ways to take in information, to share back information that will appeal to multiple learning styles so that you can take into consideration for the people who need to reflect, build in some kind of asynchronous activity that um, includes reflection time and for if you want to push people to think on their feet, for example, and that that's really important to your learning goals, we'll make everything synchronous and make everything rapid fire, have it not be um, in an order anybody can predict so that you're forced to um, think on your feet more. So I guess that was more of a, a response to his reflection piece than to your question, but. Um. Going to the Harvard Business School, where I mean, the, the world has, I, I like the idea of tailoring uh, instruction and, and providing reflection. The, the world has fundamentally changed. I think one of the realities, and this comes from my former boss, um, Al Toffler, right, is that the world has accelerated. And the one thing that we have learned, our politics before any of the rest of us, is, is, that, we have is that there is no such thing as a dead mic. Right. 
All right, you know, and so, and so like, even though we would like to basically, I, I know that Mr. Hayward would like to be able to take a couple months off and get his life back to like create and rehearse his remarks, right, at BP. And that's, that's not how it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it is, he's now on his boat again, all right, you know. But I, I, I think the, the reality of the situation is, is, is that we may not have these moments for reflection. I mean, you at the Harvard Business School are creating. I mean, you are the leadership engine. I mean, I, I, what, what are you telling? I mean, I, I, if I can, you, you know, do, do a moderator's moderator thing. I mean, because right. like, you asked us, what does this mean? But what is, how are you dealing with the fact that, that it would be nice if you had these moments of reflection or you were making decisions on a quarterly basis? But we're not anymore. I mean, what, I, what, 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 what do we tell people? We're, we're, it's got to be real time fast, where you have to be bond, tra tra you know, bond trader quick in your responses to very strategic questions that you may not even though you have access to the entire world, do not have, can't process it as much as you would like. So, agreed. And so I think the real issue becomes how do you make decisions, right? And so it's really a question about in this world of endless noise called content, being able to ferret out what is trustable, what is factual, what is, what is opinion-based, and also being, under, being able to understand what are your frameworks by which you're going to make your decisions. When are you making a decision? And doing it deliberately, right? I think the other thing is as fast as the world is going and it is going faster, it's okay to slow down the world. How many of you in the last two months have deliberately said, you know what, I'm not gonna make this decision right now? Oh, that's a very good thing to do. <laughs> right? And what was the downside to doing that? if any. And in fact, there's probably big upside, right? If I got to a better decision. So I think it's very, very, to steal a word from an analyst firm that's not with us, it's very easy to fall prey to the hype cycle, right? Also not a sponsor, <laughs> should be, we'll call them. I'm 80% certain we'll try. <laughs> But you know, I mean, a lot of this, what we hear, my, my personal opinion, is we hear us getting hyped into the fact that you have to decide everything this second. And I don't subscribe to it. That's a very powerful takeaway. I mean, we really, as leaders, we get to choose when the decision is made. And there was that, you know, remember Obama had that moment, you know, you gotta make a decision, and he actually stepped back from it. But we don't realize, many of us don't realize it, but we do have, that's actually one of the levers of control that we have. I don't yeah. think a lot of people know that. But we, have the very we have the throttle, we have the throttle on Les Armstrong actively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But so, so building on this point, and maybe asking you, David, to think about this one to start our conversation. So it is true that, that the way one effectively uses this world of noisy content is to be discriminating. And so I just wonder, as you think about the student today, as you think about people entering the workforce, what do we need to do to ensure that they're discriminating? So it's what, pedigree and provenance of that information, right? Right. I, uh, reviews, reviews, but that doesn't mean they're right. It just means well, do you guys, how many believe every rating you see in Amazon? <laughs> but how many of you subconsciously are actually guided by that? I bet a lot more. No. Would we? No. Or consciously. Consciously, yeah. Sure. How many of you look below the first page results in Google? How many of you search through multiple search engines? You guys are pretty good. Most people don't. We've been CIOs. We've been lied to forever. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm interrupting David. So. My answer is I don't think the students need that much help in the way that we think that they do. You saw them sitting up here. <laughs> They know more about everything, I think, than I ever knew. Uh, these are sophisticated folks growing up in this world. I think the, the better model for <clears throat> working with students in this cacophony of content, changing world, is not uh, I'm the expert, I'm the adult, and you exist for me to fill you with my knowledge, but we are both figuring this out, and we can learn both ways. And that's, uh, you know, in the, in the pedagogy world, <clears throat> that's known as the atelier model. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it draws from uh, like studio art classes. <clears throat> everybody has to produce their own art. The teacher can't tell everybody everything they need to know. The teacher's in the room, right? It's a team. They work with each other. You're painting, I'm painting, we're looking at each other. The teacher walks by and says, more yellow, moves on, right? 
And uh, oh my gosh, you did this in a way I never saw. Teacher learns, right? So I think that's a learning community. I think we talked about earlier today or yesterday um, the thing, I think Thornton said this. Uh, I was listening. The thing that we have to do is create environments for people to innovate. So I think in higher education, innovate is a synonym with learn. If you learn in higher education, it's the same as innovating in, outside of higher education. So our job is, oh, thank you very much. Helpful. Um, our job is to uh, create environments for people, groups of people to learn. And we need to look at those groups not in the traditional roles that we have used. So not faculty up here, students down here, staff to the side, librarians hiding behind a stack of books. <laughs> Throw them all in the middle. We're all learners. We're dealing with a complex dynamic system in constant change. And we're going to try to figure out what we need to do together. Yeah, sure, go uh, If uh, Think of the film uh, North by Northwest. Yep. There's a great moment in that film when, after the fake shooting in, at, uh, in South Dakota, Cary Grant's getting up from his hospital bed, putting on his nice loafers, and the FBI man comes in and explains to him that his death has acquired the authority of the printed page. And that's one of the uh, real transitions that we're talking about here, is the dispersion of authority from concentrated, recognized organs, newspapers, journals, books, institutions, to really all of us. We each have our own degree of authority, and we try to establish that authority as best we can when we're publishing our YouTube videos and our blog postings and our tweets and what have you. Um, and that makes it very difficult for any ordinary person to understand, well, what is the, what is the context for this posting, this tweet, this uh, blog message? I mean, what, what's, where's the authority basis? Where's the basis for the truth of this or, re or even relevancy of this posting? And, and that's where I think the skill set needs to be concentrated, at least at some point in the curriculum, for students to learn the tools for evaluating an utterance, whatever it might be, and evaluating it in a variety of ways for a variety of purposes. Now, another element of that dispersion of authority is the kind of breakdown of um, you know, rationality or rational consideration as a basis for evaluating uh, an utterance. Uh, and you can see that all the time in the denialists the world over, you know, re rebuking, you know, well-established uh, understandings. Mm -hmm. So how do you... Are we students to be discriminated? Um, so the ed school where I work is, uh, it's a professional school. There's no undergrad. It's just master's and doctoral students. And uh, so it's a training field to go into the field of education, like the business school is to go into business. So um, one way to tackle that is to look at what kinds of jobs they're going to go into and prepare them through the materials and activities of the course of instruction so that they can carry that with them into the field. So you'd immediately think we're talking about preparing teachers, but actually the ed school does um, so many other areas of education besides teaching as well, but teaching's a good simple example. So, um, you know, if you want uh, the students in your classroom, if this is an ed school classroom and you're all the students, you're preparing to become teachers, then you're going to go into a classroom next year and be teachers of students at the high school level like this. So you want to help them in, the, um, in their ed school courses get better at wading through content and also sh train them on how they can train their students to wade through content. So it's kind of fun to be at the ed school. It's very meta because any coursework is really preparation for people to go out and do more coursework. Um, so I think that uh, helping somebody um, figure out how to wade through so much content through the context of how would you show the next person how to wade through content is a powerful approach. Also, I think it goes back to the learning objectives. And I used to be a teacher, as Stephen mentioned, so I'm going to keep returning to this. But um, you know, what do you want them to learn? If I think about uh, co-creating content on a wiki, if you're just going to throw a wiki into a course and say, oh, we're going to use a wiki because it's this year's podcast, next year's Second Life, whatever, so um, with no <laughs> activity around it or no learning objectives with it, then it's not going to work well. But if, the, as the teacher, who's the guy, the coach that says, here's the assignment. We need you to break into groups of four and work on this together, and you're going to be peer editors, that sort of thing, and give them some context and, and then um, guide them. Don't just let them go off. It, you might have a more successful experience if the activity is to co-create content. So you're going to go out and do stuff and return um, to have an activity. Have some, have some parameters around that. 
um, if you're going to ask people to co-create a reference list to back to a simple wiki example, um, let the peer group do it actually. So everyone's going to come up with a co-constructed reading list. Some people are going to have great readings and some people are going to suggest terrible readings. And then it's like the kind of, is that Michael Vick? The dogs fighting with each other. Let the students uh, fight with each other and say this is not a good, you know, this isn't a good reading. This is not a valid um, resource and so on. And, and let the group um, rise to the top. But I still feel like the faculty member has a responsibility as a guide and a coach in that process. How many in the room are responsible for onboarding or within your organization, in your organizations? How many of you onboard 20-somethings into your company? What's your approach? How do you ensure that they're discriminating? What do you do for them? Onboarding of employees, but most of the onboarding we do are students. And uh, um, just in the interest of full disclosure, Dave and I are peers and, and colleagues in, in a combined organization that's library and technology services. And we try to um, look at um, both use of content and use of technology and all of the ancillary things kind of um, holistically, and, and we hold workshops. Uh, graduate students would be a good example. The, the new class of graduate students, um, much more focused and, and disciplined, and, and we, we had a joint um, workshop where they met all of the subject matter experts in the various areas that could help them with things, uh, along with our security and privacy program, along with our technology support program, and um, tried to cultivate in them being um, kind of conspicuous consumers of digital information. We talk a lot about uh, what's necessary in digital literacy, and, and faculty still have not completely embraced that as a, as a full part of the, 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 the curriculum and, and, and the pedagogy, but in fact it is, because it's, it's the lens through which these people are consuming um, the, the information that we provide to them. And it's really, really important. We, don't, we only get a couple of shots during their life cycle with us to, to, to do that, but um, we, we, we do it as... Uh, as uh, uh, energetically as we can and and we do have we we do have repeat customers who, who come back to us so so we're you know that's a that's a good sign thank you others how are you dealing with this issue of digital literacy in your own workforce in your own team or how's your company dealing with it or not is there a risk to not dealing with it what's the risk you're shaking your head yes Well, actually, I know who does, and I'm going I'm I'm to rat him out. I'm gonna, he's right here, Bill Donaldson from MITRE. So actually, I'm going to turn around the other way. I think that um, it's not that you heard the kids today, right? They don't need digital media experience. They don't need, you know, be discerning customers or any of that stuff. Privacy, maybe some of those other things, sure. But as far as uh, digital media and stuff like that, it's your existing staff, right? They need to learn how to communicate with the new hires, right, the, the, young, the millennials, because they're the ones that are going to say, I don't, you know, you know, Steven CIO, I, I don't care. You know, I don't care what his title is. I want to talk to him, right? I want to, right? I mean, this, right? I mean they, don't, they, they have no, they're not afraid of boundaries or authority or titles. So I think it's, you know, turn around the other way. How are you going to educate your existing, you know, staff and convert them so they can communicate with the new people that are going to take over so the, so it's right. not onboarding, it's overboarding. Right. But beyond, beyond, <laughs> Throw them overboard. But beyond communication. Softboarding. Beyond, Waterboarding. Beyond communication, 
And it's a really helpful comment. Appreciate it. How do you teach them to be discriminating? How many of you have ever been victim to a bad outcome based on quote unquote information your staff assembled and when you peel back the layers of it, you realize that the source of this information was just wrong. Anybody ever have that happen? Whether it's a patch that you've put in, whether it's a strategic decision that you've made, whether it's a product launch announcement that you've done. Anybody ever been victim to that? I would suggest most people have. What do we need to do as a community of educators and business practitioners on the issue of making people opportunities uh, opportunistically skeptical. Question. Sometimes I think that people forget that they have the intent to cause problems. And you get into the analog world, and you get overwhelmed by you know, all the digital part of it, and you think, oh, this is, I don't know how to do this. And you know, I like to remind people sometimes that they, they have that intent, and that training and leadership or the questions that you would ask to model that behavior to them are really So back to basics, fundamentals of analysis and decision making. mind touching that one. Tell me if I am uh, didn't hear you correctly, but um, we go through that a lot because, you know, I work at Harvard and the faculty's pretty seasoned for the most part, and so it is kind of the higher you climb, the harder you fall. So a lot of our faculty, as you would expect, um, are hesitant to take chances. Uh, technology aside, but even messing with their curriculum, just like what you were saying about the case and the person in the back of the room was like, that guy got fired, the company's out of business, I'm Googling this. Um, so the faculty is very hesitant to mess with their curriculum, and then if they are willing to mess with their curriculum, hesitant to get into new delivery modalities, or I always assign this reading, or I always do a paper course back to be so, very simple about it. You know, So sometimes, I know I said I was going to be the buzzkill in the room, but I'm with you on this one thing, I like the um, grassroots of the students who are coming to the ed school in a master's program now are typically in their mid-20s. So, you know, they grew up with the internet. They g went to college that may have had a lot of adjuncts and had a lot of innovative curriculum or innovative technology used in their curriculum, and they're forcing the hand of the more seasoned faculty. So 
I work in the IT department. I run a group that does instructional technology. We have about eight services, and um, we work with all the faculty on the simple low-bearing fruit service, you know, the course platform. And then we try and work with um, all 13 programs and two doctoral programs um, on the rest of the seven. So if you're in one program and I think that you'd be willing to, you know, try distance learning, then I might work with you on that. Uh, if you're interested in creating digital content, I'd work with you at that. And um, to be available to the community, there's only four of us, so if everybody wanted our help, we would have too much work to do for our staff. But we try and just dip in with like innovative people, skeptical people, loud voices, senior people. Little by little, we encourage the students to force the hand of the faculty. Um, and, uh, and it's not really an answer to your question, but just sort of a, um, I hear you on the fact that uh, it, it is a reality. Faculty are skeptical about trying new things, whether it's technology or curriculum. This is where I'm in a fun position because I'm like, I'm here to help you. I've been asking. Yeah. the essence of universities, this whole concept of tenure, my understanding is that tenure was created to allow intellectual freedom and risk taking. Right? Mm -hmm. so without, and, yet, and, yet, and yet it would seem, or what you're leading the witness, is that that's not happening. And not always. I mean, tenure, you could look at it in a lot of different ways. It is, um, in its purest form, it's great because it's intellectual freedom and you have no boss and you're just here. On the other hand, um, and I know we've had conversations about this before, <laughs> no one's making me get better at my job because there's no consequences if I don't. Um, and so when I'm in charge of the world, I think that's going to happen in like 20 minutes. Um, I would build in, um, for tenure and promotion, innovation in your in your teaching, innovation in the use of technologies, and innovation in helping um, a broader type of student learn, like uh, getting back to earlier about the learning, addressing multiple learning styles and stuff like that. Just show up for work. But, um, but I'm not in charge. I probably won't ever be. And so I think tenure continues to have its benefits and limitations that you'd think of. It's uh, the freedom is in their scholarship, and the intellectual freedom is expressed in how they do their individualized scholarship production, because that's what they care about in the tenure traditionally. So they weren't trained to teach well. Uh, generally speaking, most faculty didn't get intensive training in teaching, and it's not where most of their energy goes. And traditionally, but I think that's changing right now, changing right around us, and the new folks coming in, that's what they care about. They're building communities of learners in the classroom, and it's going to change everything, I think, I think eventually. Just, just to change the dynamic of the conversation a little bit, I would respectfully ask the leaders in this room, what's your responsibility? So we may give you the 20-something, but then you keep them for life, right? And so what's your response? Because most of the people working for you grew up pre-internet, or a lot of them did. You know, even if the academy was giving you everything you wanted, and I'm not saying it is, what's your responsibility in this world of content? And what are you doing about it? Right. So one question is because right, the average Gen Xer is going to have 11 jobs. So how much do I invest in somebody who's going to make a three-year social commitment to me at best? So follow-on question to your comment. What's the downside of doing nothing in this regulatory dog-eat-dog -dog kind of world where issuing the wrong kind of information about a product can be highly damaging immediately? if not creating legal problems? But if I can jump in, I, I think you've raised a, a very powerful question, but I think the idea is people do move jobs, but I mean, the great companies in the world run brilliant alumni programs, similar to the Harvard program, similar to the wonderful alumni program, or even though we're four years in here at Olin type of thing. I mean, you really do, because those people create a bond with you that will also help your company perhaps, so if you, you create, so if it is a massively powerful Massively, uh, you know, engaging and massively, you know, life-changing sort of moment. 
even if you go on to another spot, you will always be a resource. I think because we really are, you're just like the nation state is giving way to something else, right? I think, the I think that the company is giving way to something else too. And so your ability inside and outside the enterprise to marshal resources, I think so, 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 because this is a great question, because a lot of organizations, because the, I, the age of the disposable employee, I mean, you know, sort of like the Soviet Union, they pretend to pay us, we pretend to work. I mean, like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a good point. And you know, personally, I'm I'm part of two very powerful networks from two places where I worked. And as recently as last night, I was contributing to solving a problem, to helping out alum of one of these places where neither of us work anymore. But the place where I worked actually gave me some very fundamental training in basically analysis, and I'm grateful to them for that. And then it also allowed me to be part of a community. So I just, I'm not ask, suggesting that we answer the question today, but I think one of the shared responsibilities around this world of highly volatile, vast array of access to content, I think we all have a shared responsibility to make people skeptical consumers of it. And I think if we're going to rely on the academy to do that, as a nation, we're in trouble. <laughs> because the academy doesn't have them for long enough. Right? The academy can do wonderful things, but truthfully, they're going to spend most of their life outside of it. So last thing I'd ask the panelists to think about is we've talked a lot about content today. We've talked about what we think it is. We've talked about how easy it is to create. We've argued that today's students really are masters at creating it in very interesting digital ways. Uh, we've insinuated that there's a concern about quality over substance in some of those creation methods. Right, the highly formatted, beautiful spreadsheet that has voice annotated narrative to it, but doesn't foot, is a problem. We've talked about that the cost of creating content has come down, but we've also talked about the issue of findability is very real. Right? And so I'd ask the panel to think about if there's one thing you could change about our approach to content today, what would you change? Kristen? <laughs> and you can pass it to David and then answer if you like. No, because I'll forget the question by the time he's done. Um, I would say if there's one thing I could change, it's not so much change just as reinforce, and it's the last thing I'm going to say is exactly the same as the first thing that I said, is um, make sure that um, remember your learning objective first or what problem are you trying to solve. I think if you always start with what problem are you trying to solve, everything else will fall into place. Not to oversimplify, but to keep your eyes on what problem am I trying to solve here, or what problem are we trying to solve? That, to me, would be the most important reminder I have to people, because content is content is content, but it's really just a, a means to an end. It's, it's a, um, I don't know, it's nutrition. And you just need to know what problem you have, and, and so to focus on that first, and content second. What if, what, what if the problem you're trying to solve Figure out the problem you're trying to solve. That's fine. Knowing that is is empowering. No, I know, I know, no, but no, but I think that's what we're starting. Isn't that because as 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 free thinkers, as, as truly the leaders, or not not the followers or the managers, right? It, it's struck. Where do we want to focus our intellectual attention? I mean, that is not a trivial exercise, you know. Because we actually had the great talks this morning when the wonderful people were talking about that. The, the group talked about you know basically goal based. I mean, figuring out the goal. If we knew the goal. I mean, then wrong. we could actually execute towards it. I mean, but it, it's figuring out what that goal is and figuring out how to figure out what that goal is is very challenging. I think it is, but just reacting to that before, for a second. Within each of our communities, I think there are goals, right? And so, yes, we could boil the ocean and get nowhere. But I think as we enter, whether it's our work community or our, we are boiling the ocean slowly, it'll be a while. There's striped bass are going down, different issue. <laughs> Um, you know, whether it's our work community, our learning community, the communities in which we operate, I think you can define goals. And I think you should define goals that get you stepwise forward. Uh, otherwise, I think you're paralyzed. And that's the last thing we need right now coming out of a recession. Um, what was the question again? Ah. <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, my thought is, is exactly actually the same thing as your message. So um, from my perspective in higher ed, um, it's not about content. 
It's about it, it, higher ed has a mission as to help people learn, right? And what learning is evolves, um, and what people need to know evolves. We got to help them learn this stuff. Content's always going to be evaluated in higher ed on how, whether or not it helps people learn. So if you want to get you know content to the people in higher ed, that's all you got to know is like figure out how what format to put it in to help people learn. Um, it's not going to be. I don't think it's going to be. It's not going to be rules about how the content is instructed, constructed or served outside of higher ed. It's going to be about whether or not ultimately when the rubber meets the road in the classroom or wherever people are learning, can this be absorbed? Is it helpful? Which is the same thing that you said, I think. What are your learning outcomes? It's fun to go second. Isn't yes, it is. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Questions for us on anything? You were looking at me with a glint in your eye. I knew I was in trouble. You know, we're, nobody is really sure what the future of the library is because I'm not sure that anything that we are currently doing today needs to be done as we move forwards, right? Uh, you don't need our help to find stuff. You know how to do that. Uh, so we still have the keys to some special stuff that you want to see us about eventually, but I don't know that we need to keep those keys. Um, you know, so I'm not sure what the role of the library is and how we can add value in 20 years. So what I tell people, and they don't like to hear it because it's vague, it's not a goal. Uh, I tell people, the one thing that's not going to change in higher ed is that people are still going to need to learn and do research. So if you know as much as you can about that, the core mission of learning and doing research, you get out there with the teachers and the students and the people doing the things in the labs on the ground, you'll always be relevant because whatever happens, you'll be able to contribute to, because you know what the guiding principles are. But if you focus, right now the, the library is built on old formats. We do it really well. We manage old formats really well. Um, but they're changing. So, uh, and we don't know how to innovate. We're not particularly good at innovating. So, What I was just tweeting earlier today was, wouldn't I like to get a library school connected to Olin's innovation track? and see what comes out. Because that would actually, that might answer the question of what the future of the library is. I got one response from a Simmons GS, uh, GIST list uh, faculty member who's interested in exploring. Okay. <laughs> I have a question around the, um, uh, around the ownership of content. I mean, it's easier for me to understand if it's creative content, then it's owned by the creator. Mm -hmm. But what about content that's just a fact um, a state of something, my health record, my vehicle's health, my, my DNA, um, status of where I am at any one time, all the location information, if you want to call it a content that's getting created. Who owns that? Or who should or would own that? Does it have to have an owner? Does everything have to have an owner? I'd love to say it's all democratized and, and it's all academy, available, but that's not true. I mean, there's map data. People have closure on map data. Map data is what? It's a state of what, you know, that's, that's how, how things are in there, right? Road networks, that's, that's all that is, is real. Uh, it's data that's representing real structures and situations. So why is there ownership of that kind of data? Um, yeah, David just asked a really good question, and he's absolutely right. I mean, are we talking about ownership? Are we talking about res custodial responsibility? Um, those are two different things, and, and you bring up interesting, uh, we'll, we'll take it in pieces. You bring up really interesting um, question about facts. Who owns the answers to, or who owns facts? And uh, that, I, I don't have a clue. I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll defer to librarians and, and, uh, and intellectual property folks and, and so forth. But in terms of, of like your own personal health records and, and issues of privacy, I would say that the individual owns that. I'm speaking next month at the American Association of Medical Colleges Convention and, and this whole question of, of electronic health records. If you go to a doctor today, they have their own paper copy of all of your stuff. You go to another doctor, they have their own paper copy of all of their stuff. And, and, and they each think that that's theirs, okay? In reality, those are my health records. And when those become electronic and they can be shared real, very readily, 
Who has ultimate responsibility for that? Privacy is about four things. Knowing what's, what's being collected, knowing how it's used, being able to um, verify its correctness, and knowing something about how the information is protected. And when information starts being shared electronically by lots and lots of people, I think the owner of the information has the right to those four pieces of information about what's being done with their information. So, so they're, they're two completely different things. I think, I think um, in, uh, PII, personal identifiable information or health information about an individual, um, I, I, I think we're gonna figure that out. But your, but your question about facts, I had never thought of before. I had not, th 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 that's a great question. All I know is you don't have to cite them if Can I just argue with you on the health records for the fun of it? We argue all the time. Is, is it your health record and therefore you own it or is it the person who generates the information do they have some ownership so if i go to the doctor perhaps dick has some comment on this four or five times about my hangnail and the doctor writes in the record this person might be a bit of a hypochondriac if he comes in again we might want to send him for some sort of hang counseling or hang something hangnail testing is, is that my is that my health record and i have i have the right to see that or does the doctor have any privacy in terms of his judgment that he might not want to convey to me as a patient That's a very interesting question yeah. i don't like the fact that people say it's my health record and yeah. you know i can see everything in it because it's the no leeway to enter something into the record that he doesn't want me to see. But there's also a product of his intellect producing something, right? Yeah, so he created part of that record because he thought that's different from the facts. Yeah, 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 that's woven together that moves a concept across a period of time, right? And so if I'm an MRI provider, is that digital file of your MRI mine or yours? I'm storing it. I'm the custodian of it. There are providers out there that won't give you that file, most of them, and let you take it to another provider. I invested in the machine that made it. I invested in the machine. I <laughs> Right, it was a fee for service. Then the service was the test result, not the file itself, as another way of thinking about it. So I think you ask a very central question. I think it's probably one of the things that slows down innovation, the inability to answer this question. And I don't think it's a simple question to answer, but I would argue that if you're going into law today, this is a place to go into, yeah. yes. in all, all seriousness, because the this will continue to be an issue. Yeah, I the future. Actually, I was thinking about this question earlier. Uh, when you ask uh, <coughs> about the immediacy and availability of content, because if we think about this as content, uh, one of the things that we do, we're all electronic. So you go to have your lab test done, we put it in the system, and it's immediately available to the member. Mm -hmm. Well, suppose it's a bad outcome on, on the result, it's immediately available but without any context from a physician, and you look online and see this terrible result without any context. Right. You know, that, so the, the immediacy and availability of it without the proper context put around it can, you know, I mean, it's, it's great, it's immediately available, that's great, but you know, you, it'd be nice to have some context around it from a physician, perhaps, rather than just, you know, looking at it on your cell phone and seeing it's positive, you know, from some test, that would be better if it was negative. Which I think gets back to this question of judgment and how people use information. And I think, you know, and then so what are we expecting out of the workforce today? Because if the goal is just immediacy, I think you bring up a great example. There's a case where that may not be the right goal. And as we design access to information, as we design user experience, as we are stewards of this capability, what should the end product look like? And I think that impacts all of our businesses, be it higher ed, be it industry, be it health, be it consumer electronics. So thank you guys for a very good conversation. Thanks.